so yeah, today I'll be speaking about real-time data streaming in PostgreSQL. So before we actually get to the meat of the topic, uh, I'll just give a small introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Kaushik Ayer, as you may introduce. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so I am a software developer in Endurance International Group. We're an umbrella company of uh, hosting and domain services. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, si uh, sister companies like Big Rock, Reseller Club, Logic Boxes, and Bluehost with us. And I personally work with the platform team, and we are a monolith happy family, and our entire, mon uh, like a multi-model mo monolith actually, and we depend on PostgreSQL uh, majority, you know, uh, and we have been doing so for the past, for the well past couple of decades actually. And, huh. So, but the, for, from the past couple of years, some of the key engineering challenges that we have is to provide better user experiences and better integrations among services, uh, you know, that go well along with the platform as such. And for that, we get a lot of business and product use cases where we need to take data points which are there on our platform PostgreSQL database and actually stream it across the entire you know, system of sister services that we are trying to build upon. So today, we'll be, I'll be taking like one such example where, you know, where we try to optimize one particular uh, product request of, and business use case across all our entire platform and you know, how we, an, an, a naive solution, obviously, and then, uh, huh, and how it actually tanked, and, uh, and then how we actually went back to the drawing board. We, we looked at multiple streaming techniques, and then we actually came up with a more improved pipeline, and how it fared. And towards the latter half, like almost towards the end, I'll be discussing certain metrics and certain, uh, and certain system properties and system uh, performances which were unique and which were, like, it's almost like we did not, exp we did not infer it. It was, uh, we sort of like observed it as we were experimenting with. So yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So, huh. The so one of the major and the most important product use cases which we which the product want, which we as a platform wanted to improve is to provide uh, you know search. We want to provide radical search features to all our uh, customers because we have customers who buy domain hosting and you know a lot of products which are associated probably with one single domain, and they, and you know so. After a certain point of time, you know, we are a post-purchase experience actually. So if you buy a domain, you buy a hosting, you're mostly sorted. You know, you are you go, you probably come in like three months later when you want to renew. And after if you're a web professional and you're catering to a lot of you know a lot of other customers, you're not you're not probably gonna remember, you know, when you bought which product or what services. So you're gonna want you're gonna rely on the search bar most prominently. And we wanted to tune that search, you know, we want to provide in-text, full text, wildcard and probably even uh, fuzzy because he might not remember the domain name and we want to show the closest domain name that matches towards it. So what we thought was, but, and so we, we at, and this was a couple of years ago and well, we decided to use Elasticsearch as we want to direct all the search related results towards Elasticsearch and we built a small service around this. But yeah, as I mentioned, Elasticsearch is in one corner and all the data is in PostgreSQL in the other corner and we got to get that data from there to here. So huh, we didn't want to spend much time on this because we had a lot of else to do. So we came with a nice solution that is to build a JDBC connector effectively, which runs like a cron every so now and then. It pulls the net effective uh, you know, data points that were changed during a certain point of time, and then dump it, dump it into Elasticsearch, basically. Now, obviously, we didn't want to, like, in case Elasticsearch goes down or the PostgreSQL is not available, we don't want to repeat the reads. So we introduced a layer of Kafka in between where the JDBC connector is actually a Postgres, uh, sorry, it's actually a Kafka connector. It runs on Kafka Connect. It pulls the, it pulls the data from uh, Postgres, dumps it onto the topics, and then we have Apache NiFi, which is a simple ETL, and dumps it onto Elasticsearch. And we thought this was going to be our effective replication of data. We thought we could use this on for all different sorts of persistences, you know, uh, Elasticsearch being NoSQL and Postgres being SQL. We can try vice versa, you know, to re other in-memory data stores like Redis and whatnot. But it wasn't so the case. You know, we faced a lot of, we faced a lot of drawbacks. The most important being that when we, when we actually were ready to go live, the snapshotting mechanism that was required was quite cumbersome. So Elasticsearch, when we are initially going live, is empty. It has a cold start issue. So we got to actually like lift the data and but make sure that there are no you know inserts or updates happening at that point of time, or even if they're up, or even if they're happening, you know, it's going to be visible in our cache probably like around the next cycle of the 
uh, 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 sorry, in the, in the next cycle of when, whenever the RJDBC connector runs. And fine tuning like as to like what, like uh, how, what is the duration at which the JDBC connector actually has to continuously pull and lift that net effective state of change was largely trial and error. So we started with like, you know, two minutes. So let's say I'm currently at 12 o'clock. So I'm running my JDBC connector. So I will tell it to pull data from 1158 to 12 and or like, you know, data that was committed at 1158 or 1159 to make sure that they are connected. So they are committed. Huh. And huh. but it wasn't so the case because our system as such is, it's, as I mentioned, it's around a couple of decades old and there are some crons which are like long running, they run like tens of minutes. So like when the transaction actually gets committed, the last updated time for some of the rows are well beyond this particular whatever trial and error time window that we have set. And well, after certain, a lot of trial and error we sort of like, uh, like we settled upon like a pertinent lag saying that, okay, fine, if we are at T, when we're gonna lift information from the PostgreSQL database that was committed at T minus five minutes actually. But again, th th this is not set in all cases. So when there are like uh, bulk loads as such, uh, uh, it, it, may, it may so happen that uh, some of the information, may, some of the data points may get missed out or come much later than 10 minutes or even when uh, uh, like let's say that our Kafka is slowing down and there's back pressure. So it's not, it's at least five minutes. That's the crux word actually, it's at least. And also, so we already have an existing user experience. So what's so happening is that when the customer looks at the existing user experience, uh, his like let's say uh, to give an example, let's say that a, a user and a customer suspends his order from us. So on the existing user experience, it shows suspended. But since the message hasn't traveled all the way to the uh, uh, you know to the Elasticsearch, when he goes to our newer experience and actually sees it shows the order is active, or, and he's able to search it and it comes up as an active order. So this sort of inconsistency really you know it trips them off. Like uh, we are not actually enabling a better experience for them. We're actually causing them more confusion. And huh, and th third point is actually like uh, like it's actually like an add-on you could say. So we are using Elasticsearch as a, a NoSQL uh, document store, and we are sort of like dumping relational data as is into it. And this, this is uh, uh, like uh, two years back, so we didn't have like the concept of parent ID and all in Elasticsearch. And so technically, you had to like assemble the you had to denormalize the data from the relational database and dump it across to Elasticsearch, and well. Right, and we weren't doing so on our service end. We had to do you know, ugly joins and a lot of computation. As you know, as how today morning they're saying you had to write a lot of code, and we weren't using the Elasticsearch to the max potential of its limits. So then we actually had to go back to the drawing board because five minutes at least is not acceptable in any user experience of, so, of what not, of sorts. So we were looking at certain uh, you know other uh, streaming techniques you could say, and so one, the first one that. We, we saw was event sourcing. So, you know, we decided that effectively we cannot pull data. We are not able to effectively pull data because of a lot of system constraints. So we thought, okay, if pull doesn't work, logical thing is to go with the push. So we had to push the events from our system and then make the other system, sister systems react to the change. So event sourcing in just like a, a simple word, what happens is that whenever a business logic happens on our application, we create a domain event and we push that domain event into something called as a transaction log or a journal actually. So that the journal as such, we have it sorted, you know, we have a Kafka system, so the journal is sorted. But over here, the main issue is that our, our business logic is, I mean, as I said, we are a multi-module monolith, so there are some orders which are more new, there, and there's, then there, there are like some, some, you know, some products, some hosting services that we've integrated, they are new. So, you know, the end probably like uh, they write data to tables in, in a more cleaner fashion, maybe like, uh, like just to give an example, like let's say if the order is provisioned and initially it sets it to uh, pending, we ask the actual order to get provisioned on another layer, you say, and once that is done, we actually set it to active. And, but obviously there may be some chaotic other uh, code which directly put an active state. So we cannot sit and manually sift through each and every single flow, such flow that's designed and streamline all the events that have to come into the uh, transaction log. Now, 
but that is one of the key you know in this entire pipeline that is one of the key, uh, key key portions we don't have a database of sorts over here that particular journal entry we have that is our source of truth and that is the advantage that we get with event sourcing where we don't store a net state and whenever we want to obtain the net state we take a window we apply all those events and the net state that we get you know that is you know, that, 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 that is effective per se there are some advantages of this, obviously, in the sense that uh, if there are errors, you can always replay them whenever you want. Uh, you know, the, the there's a history that's being maintained. This can be repurposed as a audit log of sorts. But huh, we need a persistence of sorts. We need a persistent state to be our source of truth. And that's where we come to change data capture. So, uh, change, data, change data capture is, there, there are a lot of shared use cases between event sourcing and change data capture. Uh, a lot, I mean, the majority of the pipeline is almost the same. There is one key component that is there in change data capture, that is that we, do, we as an application do not push the domain events into the transaction log. We commit the transaction into the database and the change events are emitted from this particular, from the, from the database log file, you could say. So in case of MySQL, it would be the bin log, and in the case of PostgreSQL, it would be the wall log. And those changes, we you know, we capture it and we process it. So, I, I mean, just to focus down on just like, you know, a couple of services. So while in the domain, in, while in the event sourcing uh, example, when, 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 when we directly push, let's say that we are not able to push the a sanitized set of events into the queue, we have to add logic into our consumers, uh, you know, with variety. It's basically, it's complicated, it's convoluted, no one wants to do that. But over here, what we can do is, since we are committing into a PostgreSQL database, let's say that we actually want to sanitize our input. Since we already have a source of truth as, as the database, we can take the events, we can sanitize it, and we can replay them back onto the database. Or even so, we can filter out the uh, we can filter out the events. We can negate some of the events and then push it down to another downstream consumer and build a topology of sorts. Because we know that we have a database as a source of truth, so the majority of the application that are relying on the database are not being affected. So in that way, this one-ups the event sourcing, especially in our case scenario where we are not 100% sure as to what all flows will hit. Because if in case we miss out some particular event, uh, you know, will be we might miss out on information. So, you know, delayed data is, I would probably put it better than missing data. That's more uh, irritating to handle. And also, in event sourcing, in an event source system, in the smack middle of the queue, you will have to enqueue. So, and that's all that, that has its own pain points. And we didn't want to deal with these kind of pain points. So, what does an effective CDC pipeline look like? So we obviously, so we have a database. Uh, in our case, the PostgreSQL, and then we have uh, a sort of a, a if we, uh, one second. we have sort of like a, a capture change process, basically. So whenever the database emits out such changes, there's a system which captures the changes and stores it in a memory buffer up till a certain point of time, and then and then flushes it onto the transaction log, based on and you know you can configure this how you want to. So when it's in the memory buffer, you can apply certain transformations on it. We'll be looking at it, and huh. And then once it's in the log store, you can have multiple consumers read from it, and the application you know, and the logic is most simple. So it effectively, what change data capture is? It's like derived event sourcing. So we derive the events from the net state. And, or, and like you know, sort of a way in JDBC, like what we are trying with the JDBC, is sort of the same thing. Like every so now and then, the windowed state, the like you have, let's say, the set set of uh, events would occur. They would merge together to form a state, and then we are taking the net state. But over there, but, but and similarly over here, if you take the same window, the two minutes window, whatever we have, we would get the net state. But since the events are being triggered from the DB end. And the events are, do get flushed onto the capture process only when the transaction is committed. We are sure, we are 100% sure that we will not miss any of the events that so occur. So a sim small comparison between CDC and event sourcing is, as I mentioned, CDC is also a form of, uh, is, you can consider it as a derived event sourcing. So we're, we're not losing a lot from the event sourcing paradigms, but you know, uh, uh, we are we we do get the flexibility of having a constant state along with the events that contribute to it, and uh, and that attributes towards its flexibility. 
so we went with the CDC route. You know, we, we wanted to uh, build a, we, so, we, so then we decided that we want to build a CDC pipeline. So have any of you guys tried to like have a CDC pipeline in your company of sorts, a small raise of hands? Huh. So we also did the standard Google search and we found a list of uh, CDC software. Uh, I think Netflix Delta is one of the more recent ones and uh, they have done, you know, they have, and they've open sourced the project as well. So you guys can take a look at it. It's some interesting concepts that they, that they have built. But we obviously wanted to use a more open source one and that has a large community backing towards it. So we went with Debezium. So Debezium is that, so in this particular CDC component, Debezium sort of sits in the, it's, it is, it has like both. It has the capture change process and it has an internal memory buffer and it has the sanitization, you know, message transformations, filters, masking and all. And it has the ability, and since it sits and it sits well with the Kafka ecosystem that we currently have, and so we sort of get like the complete package. Huh. So when uh, uh, just to elaborate, just to build upon what I was trying to say, the Debezium message like that we get into our Kafka queue is like it's pretty detailed. Uh, it's sort of like this: you have like a row time, row key, some standard stuff. It has a before, like what was the row before the operation that was occurred, what was the value of the row after the operation has occurred, and it's got a plethora of met metadata. You can use a lot of this metadata just in case you are trying to upgrade the Debezium version in between your actual streaming process. So Debezium is smart enough to understand that and you know it, uh, it seamlessly rolls over to the newer version of Debezium if ever you're trying to upgrade and huh, you, will not, you will not lose any event during this process. And there, there are certain CDC uh, te techniques b before where you would require you to add a particular column of sorts on your table so that it could maintain the information as to whether when this event was, when this data uh, row entry was captured or moved to the transaction log or was emitted out. But you know, Debezium does not require any of this. So when, it, when you install it, you can use it out of the box with your particular database of choice. And it has robust snapshot mechanisms. Like it's got, uh, like just to name a few, uh, it's, uh, 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 you can choose to take an initial snapshot of your entire database into the queue. And you can use the PostgreSQL's uh, exported, exported uh, snapshot mechanism where it does not lock onto the entire table actually. And, uh, and so even if new inserts are coming, once the snapshot mechanism is over, the inserts are also rolled over into your transaction log, and huh. and as I mentioned, it's got some it's got some good built-in features and masking. Uh, I will be explaining some of like one of the most common message transformation techniques that Debezium provides, and also since it's a Java connector, we can use JMX monitoring, and uh, we can we ship that to uh, NP, we like not exactly ship it, but we monitor. We can monitor it through something like npm, and we can constantly uh, sorry, not npm, uh, new relic, huh. and we can constantly monitor uh, some of the key stats, like what are the thread processor is running, how much memory it's consuming, and we can go, you know reactively increase and re and sort of like scale up our resources. Now, obviously by now you guys would have realized that I've been talking about Kafka as our transaction log, but in case you already have a non-Kafka, you want to have a non-Kafka pipeline, like you want to experiment with the new Apache Pulsar or something like that, it ha Debezium comes in an embedded variant also. So you can add a small producer as well, like whatever Kafka, or whatever Debezium has written with Kafka as its transaction log, you could sort of mirror the same with the Debezium embedded jar, and it would work the same pretty much. It's, uh, de de like why Debezium went with Kafka is because it fits well with the entire ecosystem. Huh. So now coming to act so coming to our pipeline, the pipeline that we have current that we have currently deployed and we you know and we currently tested out. So the main thing is like the brain, the neuron of this entire process is PostgreSQL. So all of this magic starts at the PostgreSQL level, and the PostgreSQL has to emit the changes, and the rest of the pipeline is basically reacting towards the whole change. So the key changes that we had to do towards PostgreSQL is, well, you know, we had to enable logical replication. So for as a you know, small uh, introduction to what logical replication is, um, uh, ba basically instead of uh, 
uh, instead of writing the uh, information into a bin, you know, instead of replicating the data from may, maybe a master to a uh, from a master to a slave, as the as the binary wall records, you actually send the human readable information from a publisher and a consumer consumes it, a simple pub sub model, and it gets played on by by the consumer. So you have wall senders and wall receivers on both ends, which are able to emit such information in a human readable manner. So how it actually, so how uh, logical replication actually maintains this information as to w you know w till what level the events have been transferred across from one from the master to the slave is via the log sequence numbers, and uh, replication slots are ideally they're like apparatuses where you know, b before it uh, like before uh, when the publisher publishes it it goes through a replication slot and then out to the wall sender, so. And uh, what we can, so uh, what happens is basically, now let's, but it's not the replication slots, uh, you could say like purpose to convert it into a human readable format. You need something to actually convert it into that human readable format, or like norm, layman's term, like JSON, you know, pretty JSON. So for that we have logical decoders. So we tested out with a couple of logical de decoders, Walter JSON, and then we switched over to, we, we experimented with PG output as well, the native, uh, the native logical decoder for Postgres, which comes with any version about 10, 10, 10 dot, uh, any version of about 10. And uh, this, uh, huh, now you don't need actually, PG output comes built in with Postgres equal 10, so you don't need to install a external decoder. Yes, it scales really well. Actually, I can show you the graphs at the end, you know in some time. Huh. So we deploy the Debezium connector through Kafka REST, and the connector configuration looks something like this, basically. So uh, huh, the connector classes, most of them are uh, they're, they're pretty uh, pretty self-descriptive, and they are present on the and, and they're present on Debezium's website. It's got clear documentation of it. Some of the most important, uh, like. You could say the jargons that we can remember is so they, it like Debezium provides table whitelisting. So if you don't want to like stream changes of your entire database, but just particular tables, you can whitelist them. You can even blacklist certain you know tables. Uh, huh. And also uh, some of the more uh, interesting things are the database server name actually. So let's say you have a, a table called reseller, which is under the schema public. So what? So how Debezium actually puts it into the Kafka topic? Like basically, the topic name that gets constructed is your database server name. So here, whatever I have foundation testing reseller to dot public dot reseller. So it's pretty self-explanatory in that fashion. And huh? Uh, yes. So now our pipeline looks like this basically. So PostgreSQL emits the events. Through a, wall, through a wall sender, and then it goes through PG output or Walter JSON's decoder. Debezium captures it. Debezium stores it in the uh, you know the memory that Kafka Connect provides. And then once it once it reads the entire transaction, it flushes into Kafka. And then we have a sync connector on Kafka, which sort of listens to it and then dumps it onto Elasticsearch. Now we can customize the sync portion. We can. Uh, uh, you know, we can write our own consumer, and you can use uh, Kafka. We, so we have used case streams and case equal to actually perform join streams. You know, with case equal in case streams, you can do join, you know stream table joins. So we have performed that to denormalize some of the relational data into non-relational data. Yes. I'm, I'm so sorry. Can you speak louder? I'm yes. Yes, yes. Yes. So we pro we have like, uh, I mean, like, huh, we could have gone with something like. Uh, uh, Python does both of this stuff in one go. So why didn't you look for that? Because. Uh, what is happening, you have the hops, and each hop is having a context switch, which creates a performance issues and then manageability and scalability down the road. So you don't have a clear need just for the CDC. It's a hybrid need of CDC plus ETL. So you need, need to look for a tool which does both in one go. No, so we have analytics requirements also. So whatever data, like whatever uh, data that we have in our Kafka queue, they go down through analytics pipelines also, and they're used for like running models as well. So, 
targets and then they provide the capability as that. So huh. the consumption is a different thing. Right now to solve a hybrid need, I think uh, it could be a different way to do it. Yeah, I mean like we, we want to like uh, sort of like build a solution in-house. Uh, so, so that we have the you know a complete capacity to like scale it in, on our end, but if it if it so happened like and we ran uh, equivalent tests on it and they sort of like uh, satisfied our requirements for now, so we did not have to like uh, we did look at options like stitch data, uh, which talent have so they provide like end to end relation non relation to any of the others, but as such we are we do not require that much you know like we, we, we are still we are still new to this you know, incumbents so we don't know if we are at that stage yet where where we, we we take this concern and ship it to them and we just worry about consuming it or just like using it so this is this is sort of like working for us as such that's how our uh, scale is so for now so huh but if it so happens then yes we do have stitch data in mind yes so i understand that your uh, use case with CDC is that you want to capture the updates that are <coughs> Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, for that, you have to enable logical decoding in Postgres. Yes. Uh, so there is, a, there is an extra overhead to be able to write uh, right ahead logs. Basically, logically decodable right ahead logs are larger, yes. right? Yes. So you are basically paying more IO cost there. Uh, so yes. did you uh, explore uh, a logical checkpointing uh, mechanism, basically, instead of emitting change capture events okay. from Postgres. Uh, instead of that, actually writing the checkpointing information inside Postgres itself, so that later at any point of time, you can just pull the data that is changed using a pull mechanism rather than a push mechanism. Mm, no, we didn't actually look at the, the whole checkpointing portion because like, uh, so one of the main key reasons is like, since since it comes out of, I mean, like since it comes out of the wall sender, but as 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 and when the slave is receiving receiving it, our DBZM connector receive receives as well. So that was like our main focus as such. As such, like you know, we are not like so uh, hell bent on like the IOPS portion as such. But if we do see IOPS, then huh, we would have to like look at such a solution. Yes. Are there other consumers of the of yes the yes. The Yes, yes, there are. Uh, we have like Redis, consum uh, Redis consumers and also like uh, archiving those kind of stuff. Okay. We have a we have sort of like ecosystem that that sort of like wants to react to to, to this stream changes. Thank you. So, uh, I guess I'll just skip to a couple of the results and uh, so, uh, huh. So this is like sort of like a uh, a, a bare bone graph of like what we charted across. So currently, so what we exactly did was uh, we took so in, in a I mean we just ran bulk clothes and progressively like uh, sort of loaded it and we tried to like see the total time lag that it would take to uh, to completely ingest the the bulk you know whatever uh, set of entries that we have on the D DB. So if you see that for one at around one million, we're able to like you know it's done in like 42 seconds so that's miles and bounds ahead of what we were facing initially and huh so I think uh, I mentioned I sort of like hinted this at hinted at this before so we did do the same comparison between different logical decoders so if you see uh, at as the load progressively increases at around like 3.5 million uh, there's at least like you know a good 20 percent improvement in PG output as compared to wall to JSON and since, since it comes like out of the box it's you can like it just runs and huh. so we also wanted to know we, we also want to like uh, conclusively prove as to whether CDC affects like other loads like application loads so if you see we ran that a uh, you know a progressive load with like one user we, re we wrote like a simple Python scripts which would like do random 100k 1 million 2 million inserts onto the DB and then we simulated with 10 such connections. So the graphs are almost, you know, the co located is so similar. So that means that the load that CDC, uh, the, I mean, like uh, basically like when, when, the, uh, when the CDC pipeline or the PostgreSQL emits the uh, e event, you know, it's sort of like independent of the DB connections. So your application d does not take any hit. And uh, just to like uh, summarize of what we're able to achieve, the lag is now in order of milliseconds and the customers are happy. And we have effectively decoupled a, a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the system over there, uh, and also we have high 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 fault tolerance. So if Debezium goes down or like Debezium you, you're upgrading, you don't like your downstream consumers don't actually see any of the issues as such. 
And so to actually like uh, to actually run this progressive load setup, we have used like an AWS M4 dot x you know x large container. It's around like 20 cents an hour, and we ran like uh, production grade uh, loads on it. So if you guys are thinking about uh, setting up a CDC pipeline, it is not as costly as one may think. Uh, thank you. Uh, any more questions, guys? Oh well. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much.